Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming. We're a small group this morning. My favorite students. <laughs> As I previously announced, today we're not going to spend a lot of time as we are supposed to do on a Wednesday on a book whose contents are in some ways Machiavellian. In the case of this week, the book is The 48 Laws of Power, hardcover edition by Robert Green, and you find the second name, Juice Alpers, but the second name is not really a co-author. And I'll explain what happened in the case of this book, which sold very well and really started a writing career for Robert Green, a career that he was giving up on. Created a model also, a formula, a template, that was successful. If I have time, I'm going to introduce Robert Greene, and I didn't have time yesterday, but today I'm going to post a link to a PDF where I collected excerpts from this book. And this time it's not going to be just a couple of pages, as in the case of Stanley Bing, and Stanley Bing didn't deserve much more than that. Although you can still use Stanley Bing's What Would Machiavelli Do for a Paper exactly because it might be easier than with other texts to perform your Machiavellian analysis, to compare the contents of Stanley Bing's book to the contents of the prints and find similarities, few differences, a lot of them, articulate your discussion of the differences, see where uh, being deviated from the path set by Machiavelli in the print. I'm going to spend most of my day here talking about cons because there is the first assignment that is due on Friday, which is a narrative where you pick one of the cons that you find linked in a presentation called Evaluating Machiavellian Games inside section B, I believe. You describe, you summarize that con in your own words because the summary itself, the description, is supposed to illuminate your understanding of the essential elements. Meaning, what I mean is that in any of the pages that I linked, there are one or tens of more than 10 different cons and scams. Their description is the description that you would find in an article in the news, in the chronicle of something that is going on in our town. However, you approach this with an expert eye and therefore your description is not simply a description. Your description already organizes the incident that uh, is, is the execution of the con in a way that prepares your analysis. So I will model that kind of analysis. Of course, you're invited to interrupt me at any time, not just for clarification, but thinking I have to do something similar myself and I can expand, I can clarify, I can explain. We'll do that more in details for the first con, and then I'll go through three more just quickly so that we make sure that we get it. I do realize that my introduction of the topic comes late, and it was planned for an earlier week, and we only have two days between now and the deadline for the assignment. But if you need to speak to me, you can schedule an appointment on Zoom before the assignment. If you need more time, because you still have to get it, let me know. But let me know before the deadline and explain when you would be planning to complete the assignment. Let me know what you need 
in terms of assistance in order to complete the assignment, okay? And the format of the assignment, if you remember, you have to open a Google Docs file where you will place this and a few more assignments that will be uh, given during the semester. Eventually, you will place there your final paper. Of course, you have to share the Google Docs with me, giving me the right to view, comment, edit the text so that I can place now or in the final version my comments, my feedback, the grades, etc., etc. And it's also something that since we share, we can also look at during any Zoom session or when you come to the office and we can put it on the screen of a computer. So the list of funds that I'm going to present today is included in a picture at the beginning of week four on the class wiki. And the first con or scan that we're going to talk about is called the ring. The ring was a popular scan during the 2000s and well into the 2010s. It might be going around even now I included, among other links, a link to a discussion going on on TripAdvisor where people tell each other stories of how they were targeted for this con or even became the victims of this con, which is interesting because it's not the journalist's presentation, it's not the expert's opinion on this, but is the experience of a tourist. It is essential to understand that for the con to be more successful, for the con to be predictably successful, which doesn't mean it works every time, it just means it works more than majority of time, that it doesn't work in a lucky or random kind of way, it's essential to understand that it is played in a place where tourists can be found and the ideal victim is a tourist for reasons that have to do with the context. Let's go back though, let's step back before we engage in the description and perhaps we can try and play out the uh, the con, uh, I'll be the con artist, and you'll play the part of the victims, and we'll see how it goes. Let's step back and think about something. So we're trying to find practices that may be immoral or amoral in the personal lives of everyone, practices that can be illegal in the court of law of a community or a country or even criminal and try to ascertain to what extent those practices can be correctly, accurately defined as Machiavelli. Because we're trying to understand that Machiavelli could not be defined a genius or an innovator if all, all he did was to say, as Stanley being suggested, cheat, lie, be violent, be forceful, be manipulative, and don't, <coughs> don't burden your conscience. Forget about your conscience. And we also gave this interpretation of Machiavelli a name that makes it look more, more legitimate and has, in fact, a bibliography behind it, this would be to present Machiavelli just as a radical thinker. So just as someone who, for the first time in Western culture, after the Middle Ages, had the courage to call a spade a spade, to say politics is a dirty business, and therefore, 
These are the kinds of examples that are appropriate in a book about political leadership. But again, we said, this is a very simplistic interpretation, right? It does have some merit, right? And the debate is basically one that you find in modern philosophy from Hume to this day, the difference between talking about the world as it is or talking about the world as it ought to be, right? And so from that point of view, based on this distinction, we could say the philosophers, the intellectuals from the Middle Ages that talked about power were focusing on the world of politics, society, leadership as it ought to be, right? According to the rules and the values of the Bible, the scriptures, the interpretation of the Bible, theology, religion in general, the precedence of the traditions within the church and the religious communities. Whereas Machiavelli, according to this interpretation, as just a radical thinker, says, well, you can talk about the world as it ought to be as much as you can, but it doesn't do you any good because this is what the world is, and the world is blood and tears. Okay, well, we could accept that. Shall we try and move past that and imagine that, in fact, the Machiavellian model was intellectually more complex? And that's where my own schema comes into playing, where we deploy linguistically concepts such as power as control, control over the outcome, which may mean, as in this case, control of your victim, the tourist, the idea that power can be force, can be influence, and as I suggested the last time, so in the scene where that we, we play beautifully, uh, and the Oscar goes to Lewis for playing the part of the angry drunk. The Oscar recognized. I have some control of that situation as a police detective because I can have recourse to showing my badge and, and the drunk may stop there. I've just used my influence. Actually, it's genetically called influence, right? But more precisely, that form of influence should be called, what, any idea? It's one of the terms that I listed. Deterrence. Sorry? Deterrence. No, that's not deterrence, because I'm showing my badge. It's deterrence when I show my gun, right? So the, the next step, if I fail to exercise my control through influence, showing the badge, the symbol of power, then I show the butt of my handgun in the holster under my armpit, that is deterrence, because I'm, I'm, I'm demonstrating that I have force that I could use, although I'm not touching the gun at all. So that would be deterrence. This is influence, but more precisely is? Authority. Authority, okay, authority. And authority doesn't have to be official. It's always symbolic, but it's also subject to interpretation, right? So if you get to an intersection, uh, you, you're trying to go through at the intersection that leads to the Midtown Tunnel in Manhattan, and it's red, but you, you see a policeman that says, come on, go, 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 go. You recognize the authority because you recognize the uniform. So you know that you're safe, that you will not be crushed by a car coming through uh, whatever street that is. But still in a slightly different situation, you may go to a country club or a restaurant and you just see a member of the staff telling people, oh, move, move this way, go that way, don't come this way, right? And it is still a form of control, right? You're controlling traffic. You're having people execute your orders, but you don't have a uniform. You're not a cop. Although people very well understand that you represent 
the ownership of that place. And therefore, as such, as a member of the staff, even, even though you don't have a waiter's uniform or anything or any kind of badge, you represent the authority of the owner of that establishment, you are vested with that authority, and you recognize that authority, and therefore, you execute the orders, you move out of your lane and into a different direction to go and park farther away, okay? So, all forms of authority, which can be connected to a symbol, the badge, the uniform, or can just be understood in the context. As I said before, if I show the gun, because the first step of the first form of influence didn't work, if I show the gun is deterrence. If I pull the gun out, it's force even when I don't shoot the drum match, okay? It's still force when I point the gun. It's not just deterrence. So using the terminology, using the concepts, we can try and understand how a scam works. Let me add one thing. I was thinking about another form of authority that doesn't come with a symbol of any kind. If you, let's say, you are driving in a rural road, some remote, remote area, and there's a car stopped by the side of the road, and someone waves their hand and tries to stop you. Clearly, they're in some kind of distress, and you decide to stop, that is safe enough to stop and see if this man needs assistance. And let's say that this man, you recognize that this man is Snoop Dogg Dogg, <laughs> okay? Just to mention something of recent relevance. And he says, man, have a flat tire. And you say, well, do you need help? Do you want me to call someone? He says, well, there is no uh, reception here. We're, we're too far away, and I'm, I'm due to an important dinner or to a concert in, in, in this area. I, I need to be on my way. Uh, can, you, can you change my tire? And you don't know, well, come on, no. you're a big man, you, you can change the tire. It says, well, no, I have this concert, I have this meeting, uh, I cannot get dirty, I cannot soil myself. Uh, will you do that? Will you at least consider changing the tire for Snoopy, uh, Snoop Dogg? Okay. Yes, of course, right? You would at least consider, and I bet, a good number of people would just do it, or do it after a brief pause for reflection and hesitation. So, what form of influence is that? Is the kind of authority that comes from being a celebrity, okay? You recognize a celebrity, and immediately, even though there is no establish relationship between the two of you within that context where you're personally approached by a celebrity, the celebrity has some authority over you. Basically. And it's not a random thing. It's not based on luck. It's a kind of authority that will work most of the time. And the example I gave is pretty simple and primitive, but really I, I, I can create a situation, a scenario where the celebrity asks you more extreme things and still gets what they want, right? They're talking, right? But you recognize their face, you recognize it, they're a celebrity. So it's not exactly what could be called Persuasion. Persuasion would be if within the same kind of example, the same kind of scenario of the stop car, 
I am a stranger. I'm a complete stranger. You don't recognize me. I don't represent anyone or anything. And still, I'm able to talk you into changing my spare tire, right? For example, I, I tell you some kind of pitiful story. I have a disability in my back. Is, is hurting, I, I, I cannot change the tire, but I need to be out of there quickly, that would be persuasion. A form of control, controlling the outcome of that situation through talking, okay? Of course, that is not the case of a scammer, of a con artist. In that case, it is still a form of influence, but it's not authority. It's not deterrence because a scam artist, a con artist, will not have a gun, a weapon normally on them. Normally they operate without weapons. If anything, though, they might have an accomplice who is armed, who can intervene, uh, come to the rescue if the situation becomes kind of hot, kind of dicey, before the police comes. Uh, if the police comes, They'll just try to escape or talk their way out of this. In some situations, in fact, the person who executes the scam is someone who looks innocent enough. So the preference would go, in the case of the ring, to a woman or even a child or a teenager executing this so that the tourist doesn't feel threatened because, as we will see, the scam is based on the illusion of control, where, whereby the tourists will believe that they have control over the situation. And so you need someone who represents the opposite of control, someone who's not tall, big, threatening, etc. The scammers might have something as simple as a knife if things get hot too use some deterrence, not to stab you, but just to say, stay away, let me leave, leave me alone. If they're not working with a gang with accomplices. However, as I was saying, it's all about talking, but it's not persuasion. This form of influence will be called manipulation, right? Because you play some kind of mind game with the tourists. You're pulling their levers, okay? Let me go back to my premise. We said that in order for a practice that is immoral, illegal, criminal, to be defined Machiavellian, one of the elements we want to find is predictability and another element is repeatability in some form of another. Because otherwise, if you just get lucky a few times, you're not being Machiavellian. You don't really have control over the situation. You just tried your luck, and it, and it worked a few times. And it's clear then, in some ways, that a simple criminal robbing tourists using a knife or a handgun or a bank robber are not exactly Machiavellian winners in this kind of um, perspective where we can define winners or losers, people who have control over the outcome of the situation or don't have control. And it's easy to understand that because a simple criminal who robs people in the streets, or even a bank robber, don't have, never have a long career, unless they belong to an organized, you know, to a criminal organization, because members of the mafia, members of other criminal organizations, can indeed have a career that spans through decades, right? We know that there are made members of the mafia who've been in operation for 20, 30, 40 years, and some have been in operation throughout their entire life. It doesn't mean that they will not go to jail, especially if they don't belong to the top rankings of the mafia, they will have to go to jail a few times. 
for brief stints, six months, two years, five years, maybe 10, worst case scenario. But after that, they go back to doing what they used to. So if they have a career, then we recognize intuitively, if nothing else, that they are Machiavellian that there is this element of repeatability, right? Because they might go to jail as an exception when in fact they continue to do, to engage in the same kind of activities throughout their entire life with the possible exception of the jail time, but even during jail, they might continue to operate from inside a penitentiary and continue to be connected with the organization. So, Instead, in the case of a simple criminal, someone robbing tourists or someone robbing banks, we see right away that they're not Machiavellian because there are no such criminals who've been in activity more than a few years, with very few exceptions, of course, because these laws don't have absolute certainty. But if you take the world, not just the United States, you find at best a couple of bank robbers who've been able to rob more than 20 banks, right? There is the case of an Israeli bank robber whose son wrote a book a few years ago about his father's activity that he perceived indirectly as, as a kid. He wasn't aware that his father was going out robbing banks. And, and then uh, after he eventually himself was arrested, he, reconstructed the story, but it's an absolute exception that someone would be able to rob more than five, more than 10, more than 20, more than 30. The higher the numbers go, and we're talking about small numbers, and uh, uh, not big banks, clearly, but small branches, so you can make $5,000, $20,000, $50,000 at best robbing a small bank, and the higher you go, even with two-digit numbers, and the fewer examples of successful criminals you find, of course, there might be, you might tell me, there are bank robbers we never, that were never caught. Again, it's a small number. If you rob people in the streets, if you rob banks, it's only a matter of time before you're caught, and then, basically, you have to stop. Yes, you might try to go at that again after you go out, but come on, you, 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 you are in the records, right? You have the, this, this criminal record and therefore they'll, they'll catch you even sooner, even more quickly if you come out and do the same. So intuitively, we understand that simple criminals operating this way are not really Machiavellian because you don't find a strong element of predictability and repeatability. Think of scam artists. Well, we were saying very few people robbed more than 20, more than 30, more than 50 banks. For a con artist, 20, 30, 50 hits are a slow month. For some, it may be a slow week not a career. Con artists can operate successfully for hundreds or thousands of times. Do they get caught? Yeah, oftentimes they do. Eventually they do, right? And after all, we understand that from the point of view of Machiavelli because what is the other element besides predictability, repeatability, what is the other element that you want to find in a Machiavellian game? <coughs> The third element at the bottom of my schema. Yes? Necessity. Necessity, right? You do these things only when it's necessary because otherwise they become costly in terms of resources or in terms, in this case, of being caught. So eventually the police will catch up with a con artist. So especially if you don't constantly change place you can operate successfully for more than two or three years. And if you change place, then you have the costs of relocating, learning how this new place works, 
what are the places where you can operate successfully, what are the victims in this new place or community. So it becomes kind of intense, intense. But we understand that there is something more Machiavellian in here because we have someone, a category of criminals, who can operate successfully for hundreds of times if they're amateurs. Otherwise, we're talking about thousands of times. And of course, the internet may escalating those numbers much easier, right? To reach a bigger scale. So let's look at the ring, at this kind of scam, and keep in mind what is the context? What are the elements in this context that make it feel like an ecosystem, which means it's not just a place, a context defined by space and time, but you have to give some considerations to the skills of the various players involved. And also, of course, what is the goal? What is that you control and how you control it? The ring works this way. As the scam artist, I have in my hand a piece of jewelry, a gold ring with some kind of gem that is, of course, fake some kind of fake jewel that I bought in large numbers. So let's say I buy a bag of such jewels from China. And best worst case scenario, it comes down to $5 a piece. Really, if I want to splurge, right? So I have something fake in my hand, good enough that it would be sold in a shop for $20, it does cost only five, and it might pass as the real thing, okay? I hold it in my hand. I go to a place, and if you read the reports from TripAdvisor, you see people reporting on this kind of scam from places such as Barcelona, Madrid, <laughs> Paris, and the list for sure is longer. So some kind of place where there are a lot of tourists and we'll try to understand how this plays into the success, successful execution of the game. I go there, it's a piazza, and of course, it's some kind of tourist spot, so people are looking up. People are looking around, people are enjoying themselves, right? It's a beautiful day. It's a crowded place, people feel safe. As I said before, I'm not a big guy. I'm not John Cena. I'm someone who doesn't look threatening at all. Okay? I have this thing in my hand, and I approach you, and in any language that would be understood by most in that place, so let's try English. Let's imagine I use English because anyone in a tourist place in Europe would understand some English. I go to the ground and as you see, I don't even make much of an effort, right? Because you're not paying attention to me. So I don't really have to, yeah, I could throw the ring and then pick it up. But really, I don't need to, efficiency, right? I just go like this, and then I come up, and I'm just a few steps from you. I come to you and say, here, I smile, and I say, you got this. Here, here it is, your, your ring, your, your ring. And this is where you play the part of the victim, because no matter what you do, I have a script that allows me to gain control of the situation, and maintain control of the situation. Now, keep in mind, what kind of context is this, right? Of course, it's a crowded place. There might even be policemen 
in some corner of this piazza. Not too close, otherwise I won't play this game. So it's a very porous kind of game, porous kind of context in terms of space. It's also a context that is enclosed at the same time because this is the con artist, this is the tourist, okay? But then there is the larger context of the piazza. And then there is the larger context of the city itself with its police organization, authorities of different kinds, right? The context is not completely closed, sealed. It isn't. This is, this is important. But that's why I'm using manipulation I'm not using gun because as long as I'm talking who's going to intrude yeah someone might come and listen to us a policeman might notice me and, and come over but it's easy to disengage right and what have you seen what have you heard so far nothing can pin anything against me can I be convicted of anything so far I faked picking up a ring and you didn't see me fake that and I offered you a ring, offered you, right? What is the difference between a thief and a scam artist, a con artist? The thief will take your money, the con artist will give you money. So anytime, anywhere, even in the United States, even in New York, when a transaction with a stranger begins with the stranger offering you something, mm, chances are it's a scam, right? Even in this case, I'm offering you something. How can I be a thief? How can I be th threatening to you? I'm offering you something. So what's your reaction? Because we, I, I don't know you, so I don't know what reaction I might get. So I say, here, you drop this ring. Here it is. How do we go from here? How can I use manipulation to gain maintain control until I reach the outcome that I desire, what are the skills that I deploy, what are the skills that you may respond with, and what happens within this ecosystem. So let's try one possible answer. Here you dropped this ring. What's your answer? I don't idea. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Hostile, right? Because I would have expected, no, it's not mine, okay? So, no, I didn't. Now, keep in mind, manipulation is, in fact, a form of mentalism. Have you ever seen a show of a mentalist? A mentalist is a different kind of magician. A magician will pull a rabbit out of the hat. Traditionally, a mentalist or a magician will be someone who says, pick a card, and then they'll do some complicated stuff, like throwing the cards in the air, and then shooting an arrow, and, and pursing the card that you guessed, but it's all a trick. You know it's a trick. A mentalist will guess the card without touching the cards at all or will tell you, think of a number, and then they'll guess the number. No trick, just reading, just cold reading. So my cold reading of Edmund as a con artist would be kind of hostile. I might disengage right away and say, oh, okay, no problem, bye. Or I might continue and say, so, We'll, we'll go back, remind me to go back to, it's not my ring, although the variations are only slight. So I might say, ignore you, right? I don't respond to your hostility. I ignore you, I focus on the ring, I look at it, I turn it. It's oh, such a beautiful ring. This must be worth a lot. Look at the stone, look at the light. Look how transparent, how pure. 
it is. Yeah, it must be gold. Now, what are you doing? You have two options, basically. Edmund will stay there and look at the ring. I got you. Or we'll step back, disengage, walk away. Fine, I look for the next one. Okay? But if he stays, if he shows some interest, then I got it. Again, I'm not trying to control the situation, right? From his point of view, I haven't, I, I haven't even told him anything, right? I offered a ring, then I described the ring as something valuable, right? That's it for now. Completely innocent, apparently. If I got his attention, if I got him to look at the ring, then I might start with the next step and say, well, listen, I'm going to work. I, I live here in this, uh, in this city. And I'm late. I'm already late. Uh, I work in the back. You see the back over there? And, and my boss will be angry if I'm late again. Keep the ring. It, uh, if you want, give it to a policeman. Bring it to a police station. See, there is a policeman over there. Give it to him. Maybe someone lost it. Maybe it'll be put in some lost and found. Okay? And again, what is Edmund playing the part of the victim going to do? Once again, he may refuse, right? Continue to say, no, it's not mine, I don't want to bother, etc. He may walk away, or he might take the ring, right? What would you do? Uh, give it do you have any idea? Give it the so you would take the ring, right? Because give it to the police officer that comes later. Yeah. But right now, since the police officer is over there, or there is no police officer that you can recognize, because they say, see, little, little, little back, farther down. And, and of course, out of kindness, you would say, oh, yeah, yeah, I don't care, but yeah, sure, whatever. So you take the ring, okay? What do you do with the ring? You, your intention, because you're an honest man, is to take it to the police, but right now, what do you do? You look at it, oh, good, I got you good, I got you good. Then what? You put it in your pocket, right? Whether or not you want to take it to the policeman or not, chances are you put it in your pocket, right? You're there as a tourist. Are you going to hold it and walk all the way through the piazza to the policeman? Well, you, you would be that special guy. But otherwise, you put it in your pocket. And then what? You stay there, you walk away, you walk. any idea? You walk, okay, good, you walk. I got you good, I got you very good. I may myself walk a little bit, or I may stay there, and you're walking away, you're walking away slowly, right? But the ring is in your pocket. And I go back to you, and I pat your shoulder, and I say, well, actually, listen, There might be a reward involved. Looks like a ring that may be worth some money. And again, I, I have to be at my workplace. But maybe you can pocket the reward and you can give me something, 20 euros, 50 euros. And I have to read you and see what kind of money, right? Keep in mind this is worth five. So if I can get 10, 20, 50, anything is something that I've made, is profit that I've made in what? Five minutes, 10 minutes? And I can repeat this throughout the day and throughout the week with as many as I can because these are tourists. 
So it's not like the knowledge of this can will circulate in the community. It will, but it will not get to tourists that come from London, Berlin, Rome. So I can always find a fresh victim without the knowledge of this scam. Okay? So will you give me some money? Really? Okay. Okay. And do you think I could make you feel guilty about it? Right? Because you admitted this is not yours. And you pocketed it. And you said you're going to bring it to the police, but maybe you won't. How do I know that? And you looked at the ring, so you know it has some value. I can use my language to insinuate that maybe you're not such a good person. Right? I can leverage your guilt and either get the ring back and use it for the next scam, right? Because you might say, okay, okay, I, I, I surrender the ring, I, I, I give it back, you, you do whatever you want. Or since you feel kind of caught, someone may suspect you will not give the ring back, or maybe you yourself already have the ring in your pocket and you're thinking, well, Maybe uh, that's a nice gift for my girlfriend. European green found in Spain. Great, looks great, looks new. Good. But at that point, your guilt is my leverage to get some money, any kind of money. And it could be 50 euros, it could be 100 euros, if I can play it well with my language. If you feel guilty a lot, etc. And I walk away with 10, 20, 50, 100 euros in my pocket. And my loss was a five euro Chinese knockoff. Okay? So I exercise control through manipulation. I have to read what kind of victim you are, whether you're hostile, how much guilt I can produce in you, and especially if you're honest. I can use this a lot, so we'll, we'll add guilt as the element of psychological relevance. Within this context, how do we keep control of the ecosystem if this is such as a porous context, a crowded piazza? Well, I restrict the amount of time this goes on for it. I don't want to attract attention. So this has to go on quickly. A matter of minutes, really. If it drags longer, I better disengage and find the next victim. Even if you keep the ring and I lose five euros, what is it to me? The next, next guy will give me 50, so nothing. Uh, I can play the numbers. As far as the space, of course, I can also restrict the space, but I cannot come too close to my victim without making the victim feel threatened, but I want to get close enough that I don't have to shout and have people overhear me. So time and space both should be limited as much as possible within reason to exercise control because I can only retain control if I manage to squeeze time and squeeze space as much as possible. In terms of skills, well, of course, as I said, I have to read my victim. I have to stay away from someone who looks like they might be a policeman or someone who appears forceful or even angry, possibly hostile. But I'm in control without uh, really using any leadership. I give you control. So I'm safe because at best I can disengage. I know the place. This is not your place. So already as a foreigner, as a foreign tourist, because this works best with a foreign tourist, you're in a strange place and therefore you are in a weaker 
kind of position. As usual, I'll circulate the attendance. In the meantime, okay. So, is the result of this predictable? Yes. And we only had time for one variation, but we could play out other variations, right? People who say, it's not mine. And again, I can play slightly different versions of the same game in terms of the script to get the same result. And the moment you take the ring, and especially if you put it in your pocket, the moment you put it in your pocket, I know I can manipulate your mind. I know that in the back of your mind, even if you are the most honest person, in the back of your mind, you're already going through calculation. It's a nice ring, I can give it to a policeman, and I'll be fine. Or I could keep it, but I'm not that kind of person. But in the back of your mind, you're already contemplating the possibility of keeping it, and that's what I use to get my reward, right? To get my share of what you gain illicitly or you, you think you were lucky enough. And of course, if you look at it, as Edmund told us he, he would do, then it means you're thinking about it, right? Because otherwise you would just put it in your pocket and give it to a policeman. What does it matter what it is? But you're looking at it. So you're trying to evaluate, you're trying to assess whether it's worth it to give it to a policeman. Because you know how it happens? If you find $5 or $20, you just put it in your pocket. And instead, if you walk out of here and you find an entire wallet, chances are you will give it to the, manage, to the building manager, right? But if it is $1, $5, you just put it in your pocket. If you do the same with a ring, you're looking at it, you're going through this process and saying, well, it, if it is 5,000, 10,000, then maybe I must give it to the police. But if it is $100, $200, maybe, come on. The police, and, and of course I can insinuate uh, different things. If you're going to bring it to the police, when I get you afterwards and pat on your shoulder, I can say, you know, maybe the policeman will keep it. Why don't you do something else? You keep the ring, you give me something, etc. And again, it's essential that I let you go. I don't have any control. I don't give you, give me the money. I let you go. Because by letting you go, this sinks in. Your, your mental processes start running. What am I going to do with this nice ring? And that's when I go back to you the second time. I have to leave space. So it's a very loose kind of context. And that's how it works. Tens, time, tens, time, tens of times a day, hundreds of times a week or a month, thousands of times a year. Of course, eventually, the piazza may be under the control of a police team that will notice me. The city may be alerted that this scam is going on and they'll try to uh, set a special team to trap this scam artist. But really, a conviction is hard to get. You need to get footage of repetitions of this. You need to get testimonial of tourists. And what's the big difference between a tourist who's victim of this scam, who then realizes that the, the ring is a knockoff, and someone who's being robbed? And what, how is it that the tourist robber with a handgun has a shorter career than the scam artist? Because there is no force involved. He lost 20 euros, 50 euros, which is probably nothing, even 100, probably nothing to him. More importantly, was it a big trauma? Was it a traumatic event? <clears throat> no. But what about the tourist in the same city of Madrid who gets robbed with a knife or a handgun? Believe me, if you've been there, the trauma is such, even if you're not stabbed, wounded, the trauma is such that you will report it because you want revenge once the, you're released from the context. So that's how bank robbers or other criminals are caught because anyone who's the victim, nine times out of 10 or 90 times 
95 times out of 100, people involved would report it because it is such a trauma that being victimized, that being exposed to force in such a way that they will report it. Whereas chances are in this case, there will be no report. The opposite is 90 times out of 100, 95 times out of 100, maybe 99 times out of 100, there will be no report on this kind of scam. It will reach the newspapers before it reaches the police, and then from there, there may be some kind of movement. I didn't have time to go through the other examples. As I said, this is the kind of analysis with plenty of adjustments, but this is the kind of analysis you have to go for your assignment, and we can continue on Friday. I can answer any questions you may have before the assignment in reference to this example or possibly other <coughs> examples. You don't have time to introduce the reading from 48 Laws of Power. I'll do that next.